there is no separation between the American empire and our daily experience as seen through art, commerce, anything. Uh, we just choose not to see it. And so my work tries to make it visible in a way that's pleasant and beautiful and smart. Good morning. It will take 68 minutes by train to arrive at your destination. You have therapy in one Rent hour. annual report to company me. Rent is due today. Your bank account is over. Sorry about that idea. I have no idea what you are so talking about. Pick up children at noon. Your mother is hot. I take it anymore. I do not understand. You are so fine. I take it anymore. I found this information for you. You have more than one appointment You have a good point four miles to take the next exit. Okay, calm down. Shut up and listen. Let's start with a breathing exercise. First I like to start by paying attention to the way the air enters the body. Let's take a deep breath in. Feel how the air expands your lungs. Now release your breath slowly, calmly, with intention. One more time. Take a deep breath in. Noticing how the air feels as it passes through your mouth, through your nose, and fills your chest. Now relax with a prolonged, slow breath out, calmly, with intention. Now one last time. Take a big, slow, relaxing breath in and feel your belly soften and expand as you relax. And now breathe out, calmly, slowly, and with intention and feel yourself connect with the your body, your mind. Welcome to now. Yeah, so my name is Eric Carson. I, I'm an artist. I make uh, primarily painting and sculpture that uses um, recognizable visual symbols like mandalas, illuminated manuscripts, architectural models, playing cards, to try to harness all the information we see on the internet. And we have this skill that I am calling a visual hyperliteracy. Uh, so like when you read your Instagram feed or your Facebook feed, you know almost pre-consciously what is bullshit, what's not. And that just doesn't mean like, oh, this is an ad. It means like my friend always posts shit about this, so I'm just not gonna read it. I'm just gonna, you know, keep. And then uh, you, you can do that and you can ingest a huge amount of visual information and you like know it, like you make meaning from it. You wouldn't say like you spend 10 minutes looking at Instagram and you don't know what you saw. Like you remember what's important to you. So this is a skill that I think we developed in the post-internet world. And my work tries to use that skill by creating this beautiful um, symmetrical form where all these images are that bounce off each other. And you use that hyperliteracy to read the works. The idea that, I, the skill that I'm calling visual hyperliteracy is again the ability to process a very high amount of information, high volume of information, and understand um, the connections between it, uh, what one agrees with or doesn't agree with, uh, in a really uh, quick amount of time. And so I build that into my pieces by uh, lining up in a symmetrical way uh, symbols, traditions, text, uh, that uh, one might think are opposed. Uh, so I always build the piece um, around a common center. So for this, it's a, like a lotus. Um, around uh, that are, uh, is text from uh, traditions, actual traditions of insight. And in the four quadrants are four monuments to traditions of insight. So um, there's a Algonquin uh, a longhouse, there is the St. Peter's Basilica. This is a Japanese Zen temple. This is the Louvre. And then this is an observatory and a microscope. Uh, so I think you can see how one might think of these traditions as opposed to each other. Um, one could see how uh, the Western tradition, uh, whether it's Christianity or science, uh, could be opposed to um, Buddhism, especially Japanese Buddhism, in the act of bombing Hiroshima. Much in the way if you followed like science or as we were talking about art, you would say that these religious traditions are uh, naive at best um, and you discount them. So you have to contemplate them all in the same uh, visual field, much like you do on the internet when you read uh, hundreds of posts in like, what, 10 minutes. Um, I used to have this situation where my work was, and I still have it, where it's too spiritual for a gallery and it's too controversial for a church. I've tried to show in both venues and it's been shut down or edited uh, for the reasons you can probably imagine. Well, technology has always informed and shaped spirituality from the, you know, the uh, first printing press, printed the Bible. 
and now we have a smartphone where you can uh, read uh, the propaganda from any spiritual tradition you want in the world on your phone. Uh, the mainstream Bay Area maybe um, has this idea of, this kind of Steve Jobs idea of uh, you have some spiritual insight and you use it to make the iPhone, use it to make a better product or maybe the best product. And it could be argued that that's where like Uber comes from and Lyft comes from, uh, all these ways to uh, maybe in quotes uh, make, a, make a, the world better and more accessible to everybody. And yet it's the end goal of like Steve Jobs being spiritual and like how can I make the most efficient thing and here it is and then we have all this stuff. So we have the ability through the internet to look at the world. You know, you have the world in your pocket in your smartphone. And so when you meditate on the meaning of existence or the meaning of humanity, it's got to include the dark side and the light side. It's got to include our comfort and all of the horrible things that make us comfortable, like here and now in this moment. Uh, the human experience is vast and impossible to abstract into art or any symbol. Uh, it's impossible to abstract into the 26 letters that we have to use to make language to talk about it. Uh, if there are six billion people, there's six billion religions. And what I'd hope people take from my work is some glimpse into the cracks in their worldview. And not to say that there's nothing behind that, those cracks, but in fact, there's a much, much wider human experience that's possible 